Best Book Bits podcast it brings you Suzanne Chadwick, the CEO and founder of The Connection Exchange, a business brand and speaker coach. She works with savvy business women in business as well as training individuals in small to medium enterprises and corporate businesses, a regular conference speaker on building a standout business and personal brand. She's also the author of the book, Play Big, Brand Bold. It's your time to step up, show up and stand out. Suzanne, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, Michael. I'm excited to be here. No worries. And we're going to deep dive into your book. It's such an amazing book I read recently. But take us back. 22, you were working in the IT recruitment in Melbourne and got that tap on your shoulder from the boss to say, would you like to go to London? And you said, yes, yes. What happened then? And how did your journey unfold from there? Yeah, for sure. Who at 22 doesn't want a free ticket to London? So I was pretty excited about that. I knew nobody in London at all, but I just thought opportunity has knocked and I'm going to say yes. And so I got on a plane. I went via the US for a bit. My old flatmate used to live in New York. So I stopped over there and then headed over to London. And this was in 2021 and I was doing IT recruitment for a global recruitment firm and their office was on the strand for anybody that knows London. So I was right in the hub of it all and it was fantastic. But what happened then is that obviously 2021, 9-11 happened. 2001. Oh, 2001. Jeez. Yeah. (laughs) That's okay. Yeah. So 2001, that's when I landed at the beginning of that year. And then obviously in that November, 9-11 happened and the market fell out. And so I ended up getting a redundancy from that job because I was in the telco and IT market and everything just went a bit dead for quite a while, which was actually not a bad thing. I loved London, but I didn't love my job at the time. And so I came back to Australia for a bit. I was very silly and spent my redundancy money, had a great time, but then decided to go back to London because I just wasn't done with it. And I was in London over an eight year period. I was always like, no, I'll go home next year. I'm just here for a year. I'll go home next year. Anyway, I ended up getting sponsored by another recruitment company and ended up heading up recruitment for Deloitte Consulting near the end of that period and absolutely loved it. It was just one of the best jobs. And it was really interesting. And during my time heading up recruitment for the consulting division, we had this really big project where we had to hire a hundred consultants in a short period of time. So that those are people from consultants through to director level, which is just below partner. And in order to do that, they brought a brand agency in and that brand agency We worked together really closely to take a look at how we were going to attract all of these consultants, basically from competitors. And so with that brand strategy, we were looking at brand activations. So things like big billboards in the major train stations, all of the newspapers, live events, being at career fairs and looking at a lot of the messaging and how we were going to build something that really captivated and attracted the really high quality consultants and candidates that we want. And that was my first venture into branding. And I can say, Michael, I was bitten by the bug. So I was just like, what is this amazingness that is this world of branding and marketing? And I just really loved it. It really energized me. And that was the first time I thought, I think maybe it's time for me to start having a think about like where I want my career to go. Always the case that your next career is on the other side of something. Like they say, I had a conversation with someone yesterday and they said, we have about four or five major career changes in our life where decades ago, you probably had one job for the whole life, but we go through these transitions of having a job. And then all of a sudden we opened up our new markets as well. And just a quick caveat, I lived in London as well. So we packed up everything, me and my wife, and we sold up many years ago, about a decade ago. And we lived over there in Wimbledon and we had a great time. And we did the same things that you did, little flyovers to here, there, and that, Spain, Barcelona, Ibiza, Greece, all that stuff too. So we do miss it. And I got homesick and wanted to come home. My wife wanted to stay day and I think we nearly got a divorce over that but ended up I won the decision and we ended up coming home and yes I can definitely relate to the London lifestyle that you had as well I never did speed dating though but I know you have so what's your story with speed dating I was just about to say when you was talking about your wife yeah it was basically such a rage like it was all the rage in London at the time 
This was 2000, I want to say it was, I think it was about 2007, maybe 2006. And all of my girlfriends had gone and done speed dating in London. I was really not interested. I was very career driven and I was married to my friends. So I had this incredible group of mates. We basically lived and worked together. And I was just not particularly interested in being in a relationship. And so one of my girlfriends said to me, Suze, I really want to go. Will you come with me? So I was basically her wing woman on that night and and we went to the Gray's Inn Road pub in Holborn Circus and we went up to the second floor and there were 15 guys 15 girls and it was such a fun night like I actually really enjoyed it I'm a talker I'm an extrovert so that kind of environment doesn't really phase me too much but I met quite a lot of guys that I had really great conversations with and that night I met my husband and yeah we met there was definitely something there his friend at the end of the event went to the bathroom and he came over and started chatting with my girlfriend and i and we went downstairs and we sat and chatted for another couple of hours and during that time for me i was like i think that this is something big and just not being somebody who was looking, it was a really interesting dynamic because I was just like, I'm not looking, but I've actually found the guy. <laughs> yeah. It's an amazing story. And I know he's not from Australia, but whose decision was to come back to Australia in 2008? Yeah, so I was laughing when you were talking about your wife and you arguing about whether to stay or come back. I always knew I'd come back to Australia. I love London, but I feel like the weather was always a really big problem for me. I'm not a cold girl. Like I will always go somewhere warm and tropical over somewhere cold. But I said to him on our second day, I said, listen, if you're not somebody who would ever leave the UK, it's probably best that we don't continue dating. That's how sure I was that I was going to come home. And we still laugh about it because he was like, yeah, no, that's fine. I'll move anywhere. He's Welsh. But he says to me now, I would have said, I would have said yes to anything at that stage. She didn't even want to go to London. So my wife said, I'm going to go to London. Do you want to come? I said, no, I'm cool. Thinking it's a holiday. And she said, no, I'm going to London to live. You can come or you don't have to come. And I was like, all right, give me a sec. So I called my boss. We both resigned and we sold up everything and we went across there. And then funny thing was when we came back, we went back to our same jobs and back to our same friendship groups. Now, I know that you had such a long time when you came back and you're in your two bedroom unit and you realized that it wasn't London anymore and everyone or your friends have moved on. And what was that experience like coming back? I know it was hard for you. Yeah, it was really, I feel like it was a real shock to the system because you've got this whole idea of what home is like. And I love Melbourne. I think it's fantastic. I had great friends here. And I think that once again, like when we came back, I don't know, like the job market was a little bit hard as well. And my husband is in research and development in like with pharmaceuticals and Melbourne is not like a hotspot for those types of jobs either. So I ended up doing some contracting work. He looked for a job for a while and eventually found something that was miles away. And we just didn't have that circle around us. And I think I had built such incredible friendships in London where every weekend there was something social happening and we were always like, what are you doing? Come over. And so you were just never lonely. And when we got back to Melbourne, being in the suburbs as well, and just, I don't know, like the work environment was just very different. Like the people we were working with, People wouldn't really stay in the city and have drinks on a Friday night. Everybody would be heading home to their families and things like that. And so we just didn't have that social interaction. And it took us a really long time to adjust, to be honest. No, I can totally relate. It's such a different lifestyle over there. We could walk to two different train stations on two different lines and catch it. Like there was, you were just a couple minutes away from activity and being in the suburbs as well myself it's quite a quiet place and the suburbs for a reason um fast forward from 2008 to 2014 you created what they call the connection exchange but what happened in between that period of six years between 2008 and 2014 yeah so basically i had two kids during that time as well yeah thanks but but i ended up back in recruitment and in 2010, I was sitting on like the 32nd floor of one of the high rise buildings in Melbourne and as a recruitment lead. So I had a team that I was working with, but still was feeling a bit 
like I can do this, this is what I do, but do I want to continue to do this? And about three days before I went on maternity leave, a social media and brand consultant came into a meeting that we were having. And we were looking at once again, doing a big recruitment drive, et cetera. And she started talking about all the things that we had talked about back in London when we were doing that consulting recruitment drive. And I sat there thinking, oh, I remember this. And so I basically went off on maternity leave, had a baby about four months later, I connected with her on LinkedIn and I said, Sam, I don't know if you remember me. We were in this meeting at this client like four or five months ago. I really want to get into this area of business. I will work for you free of charge like a day a week over my maternity leave if you teach me everything that you know. And she said, yes. So basically on a Thursday while my baby slept, I would be on Skype calls with her and her clients looking at Twitter strategies and Facebook strategies and how we were going to build community and connection and conversion and all the rest of it. And I just absorbed. And the minute I started doing that, I started looking online for like how to understand how to do this better. And then when I ended up being on maternity leave for kind of two stints, cause I went back and I was already pregnant. So I had to take more time off. And when I got back sort of two years later, really a year and a half later, I said to my CEO, I think that we're missing an opportunity here. Like, I think that within the recruitment space, I think we could do employer branding, which is what I'd done in London with that agency. And I think it's something that we could offer our clients. And she said, okay, go, go and do it. So there was somebody else that had been doing it a little bit like a day here or a bit here and there. And she, that person really wanted to get back into people management and I wanted to get out. So just by voicing like what I really wanted and where I thought there was opportunity, they were like, all right, let's do the job swap. So I swapped with her. She took over the management of my team. I took over employer branding and that went full time. And we ended up building that into a global practice. Yeah. Wow. It's an amazing story. And one of the notes I got from that as well, you said it's about having that conversation with your higher ups, with the powers, the powers to be, or the people in your organization as well. How important is that just to voice new opportunities or how you actually feel in the role as well? I had a personal experience where I left a good paying job, just wasn't feeling it anymore. So unemployed, not unemployed. I've got a few businesses, but I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. And just to have that honest conversation, they're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm just going to take some time off a couple of months, play some golf, semi-retirement, spend some time with the kids, but I don't know, I'll find an opportunity. And then yesterday I found that opportunity after two months that came through. But how important is it just to be honest with yourself first, and then also have those honest conversations of opportunities or gaps in the market that you find that you tell your organization what's going on. Yeah. How important is that? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've always been a big one to follow the breadcrumbs. Like I think that when you get, it's almost like when I was back in London and I had that inkling, it was, how do I, like, this is something that is new. That's of interest that's sparking something inside of me. And I never forgot that. And even though I didn't take action on it at the time, it was still something that was there. And so when that, when I went on the maternity leave and came back, I just think that people who you work for can't read your mind. They're not mind readers. And I think sometimes people get, and I mean, I used to be a people manager as well. So I get this where people are like, they don't want to voice their opinions because they're worried that then their managers are going to think that they're not fully committed to the job that they're in. There's all these stories that we tell ourselves. If I'm honest, then I won't be taken as seriously. Or if I'm honest, they'll think I'm not committed and I'll get fired. Or if I say what I really want, then what happens if they can't help me? Then I'm like, do I stay or do I go? So we play these things out in our head when I'm just like, just follow the breadcrumbs, just start having small conversations. And also if you see that there's an opportunity for something to be better, then say it. 
Because I can tell you now as, a, as an ex-people manager, people who were like, we do it this way, but I actually think it could be done better and here's how we could do it. And then we take a look at that. Whether we end up going with their idea or not, I'm now thinking this is a doer. This is somebody who's open to innovating. This is somebody who's looking at what else they can be doing that might be of interest to them, but that can also help us. And so I think just also acknowledging that when we're honest with our leaders and we say what we think could be good and it's all about the way that you do it as well but also sharing with them what we would love to be doing more of they can't have the opportunity to make that happen for you if they don't know that's what you want so for me i've always been pretty open i've had really great leaders i have to say but I've always been really open about what about if we did this? And a lot of times people have been like, okay, let's give that a go and let's see. So I'm always one for testing, trying, being open about what you think. Yeah, absolutely. And just an analogy, you said follow the breadcrumbs. I'm a big Matrix fan, so follow the white rabbit. Yes. <laughs> I'm always constantly looking for the white rabbit, so always following that too. No, really cool. One of the things that you wrote in your book, which is I definitely think like something I've got a problem with, People that have project methodology, pricing and packaging frameworks, messages, and more, they don't know what it is. But in 2013, you said your girlfriend had a great corporate job. She had a baby and decided that she didn't want to go back to work, not even realizing the skills that she'd been developing and what you've learned over the years. She said, Sue, how do you put this together, the pricing, the packaging? How do you build the project methodology? How do you go to market with all these things? What was that, what was that event like? And I think the convergence of that really sparked something so what happened there yeah so obviously like i had just naturally done this and been in a conversation like when i was building the employer brand agency we had to sit down because that wasn't something that was already fully developed we're like okay do we do training with our organizations are we doing consulting what does that look like if we're doing consulting what does our consulting package involve? How much are we charging ourselves out at? And so we had to go through this whole process of figuring it out. And so by me doing that, I learned a lot in the process of how to try and do that in a really simple way. And I'm pretty fixated on simple business, simple things that you do well, that are clear and clean, that you can rinse and repeat, that help you to grow your business. That's my, I'm just like, if it can't be that, then there's something wrong. So I, yeah, so I'd been doing it for, I don't know, a couple of, maybe a couple of years. And a girlfriend of mine who was in a pretty high level role, had her baby, as you said, and then she was like, I don't really want to go back. And so I was just like, what if you just did it on your own? What about if you created your own business? She was like, I don't even know how I was do that. So literally over a dining table and some wine and notebooks and pens, I was like, okay, so what would the business be? It'll be this. All right. What kind of services would you want to offer? And we brainstormed that a bit. I said, okay, let's talk about this service. What would you do for the client? How long would it take? What would the scope be? Obviously coming from a consulting background, I understood the whole chargeable like rates that you'd have out there, but also looking at, well, what do you need to earn? Like how much do you want to earn? And then what do your products and services need to be charged at in order to do that? And so we just went through that process. What's the product? What's the price? How many clients would you need? What's the message? How are you going to, what's the actual proposition? And what's the promise that you're delivering as well? And then what do you want to be known for? So we went through those key things. And just as we did it, she was, and I was just loving it. Like I was like, and then you do this and then you do that. And then what about this? And she was just like, you need to do this. This is, you are really good at this. And I hadn't really thought about it. Like I knew it and I loved it, but I hadn't thought about it. And so she basically started to refer me to some of her girlfriends and I was just doing it for free for a couple of people. And then I started charging a bit. And then from there, I was like, okay, what does this look like for me now? So I had to go through that process for myself. I've done the same, th I've done the same thing. It's the same story. I uh, writing books for other people. So let me show you how to structure it, do this, do that. And then, and then, oh, start charging. You feel weird about it. And then you're like, okay, well, what's this look like for me now? And it's so natural, these knowledge or that intuition you have with certain business acumen 
then you got to realize, look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, now I've got to commercialize it myself. So it's funny when you're saying that, all those things are happening to me because I had the same conversations with, not the similar conversations with people and what flows from you is like new information to other people. And you're like, this is just, e just comes so natural and easy to you because of your own subject expertise and your own, no, really cool. And it, from there, what happened there with the connection exchange? How did that start? Yeah. So I went and registered a business and I went with the connection exchange because I just thought for me, what I really wanted to build was like, I, my first thought and the business has changed and evolved since then. But my first thought was I used to go to a lot of networking events and I didn't really like them. I'm like, these are not my people. I went to three, just a side note. I went to three this week or last week. And I know ex when I was reading your book yesterday, finishing your book, I'm like, I know exactly what you meant. Great people, just not your clients, but yeah, go ahead. I totally understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved like here in Australia, we've got business chicks, which I love. I think they're great, but they just, I just didn't, I wasn't looking for the mass. Yeah. Which is what a lot of those events are. And I, yeah, we just go to different events and I'm like, this is not for me. And then I would sit and think, what would I want? Like, I want to go somewhere where maybe there's like 30, 40 people in a really like nice environment where there's a couple of speakers that's really practical. I'm a very practical person. So I love hearing about practical things that people have done where they've tested and tried different things, what they were thinking at the time, some of the things that they might've overcome. And so I just thought if I can't find it, then I'll create it. And so my thought around the connection exchange is that when people come to the events, then they connect and they exchange knowledge, friendship, ideas, networks. And so that's where the name came from. And I just started doing like breakfasts, like women in business breakfasts, where exactly that I'd have 30, 40 people in a cafe somewhere in Melbourne in a private. And then I ended up doing a conference. And one of the things that I love to talk about is what I call brand jacking. So basically what that means is that if you don't have a brand, but you know somebody who has a brand that has the people that you love and that you would like to attract, then the question is, how do you connect the two? So at the time, which was 2014, 2015, I just thought I'm going to do a conference and if I could have, I was just in dream mode. If I could have anybody, who would I have? And I thought, well, obviously at the time I'd have Lisa Messenger, who was the editor in chief of the collective magazine, who had a huge female entrepreneur following who's met like whose ethos and values and ideas I totally resonated with, which was all the thought leaders, the rebels, the change makers. I was like, oh, I love all of that. And so I just Googled her email address. Like I was like, Lisa Messenger email, <laughs> it came up. I do that every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, sometimes people are like, but how do you do these things? I'm like, I just Google it. Like I just figure it out. Or on Facebook, they actually have the email address on Facebook. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So I was like, okay, if I could have anybody, who would it be? Lisa Messenger. Okay. If I could have it anywhere, where would it be? It would be at Circa, which was at the Prince in St. Kildred, in Melbourne, which is beautiful, like a gorgeous space. And then I thought, okay, what would the day look like? And I just started playing. I think this is the other thing is that I'm a big one for just, let's just imagine Imagine what could this look like? How would it be? What would I do? And I start to play with those. And then I start to go into research mode as well, where I'm like, okay. So I emailed Lisa and they got back in touch with me. And obviously there was a speaker's fee and all the rest of it. And I was like, okay, if that's the fee and this is what Circa's pricing in, what would tickets need to be? How many would I need to sell? So I'm still not committed to anything. I'm just like still in play mode. I think that when you're in that mode, it feels less serious and like you can just explore without too much pressure. And so I gathered all the information. I made the decision to do it. I didn't have any money in my business. Like I was, hadn't really been doing a lot, but I thought, okay, I'm going to put this on and it was going to cost about $40,000. And so I obviously didn't need to pay all that up front, but I needed to pay about half. So I took about 20 grand out of our mortgage, which was like the over, like what we'd paid over in our mortgage. And over the next six to nine months, I basically sold this event. 
but it wasn't selling as well as I wanted it to, which was pretty stressful. And so I was connecting with other women in business communities. I was like doing everything that I could. And there were a lot of tears, Michael. Like there were moments where I would be sitting there saying to my husband, I think I've lost our money. Like this isn't gonna work. And he was, he's a total introvert. He's pretty solid. And he was just like, it's fine. Like you'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. And I was like, that's what I needed. And at the end of the day, I just decided come hell or high water. There's no way I'm losing this money. Let's go. And I just moved into full on hustle mode. So I, I was doing to like bring somebody and get 20% off. I was selling tables. I contacted Lisa's people and I was like, I'm not, and I was really honest, I'm not going to break even. I want to do an evening event where Lisa like talks for an hour and they were like, yep. Okay. So I think just being really honest with that. So basically by running the evening event as well, which was a conversation with Lisa messenger for people who couldn't come to the whole day, then we ended up breaking even. But I hustled my butt off because I was like, there is no way that I'm going to lose this money. But that was a very big lesson for me <laughs> in events and managing costs and just sitting with risk as well. Yeah, an amazing story. And you detail quite well in chapter six. So on Wednesday, the 4th of March, 2015, you held the first epic business summit with 88 women in attendance for the day and 125 in the evening. Now it was the evening session that made you break, e break even. So yeah, an amazing story that you say, and thank you for sharing that as well. And one of the things you touched on as well was the acronym for dream. So basically you talk about the more I do big things in my business, the more I've realized that I use the little formula that you call dream. So D is for dream. R is for research where you talked about you were in research. So first you dream about something. This is like my book, success in 50 steps broken down into six words. So dream at first, do your research second, and then explore the idea. And then A is to ask. So you have to ask. And then M I like what you said when you got in that sticky point, there was lots of tears. You said, come hell or high water, you'll make it happen. And you made it happen. So M is for making it happen. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, event, running events is very stressful. I just went to a massive event for David Goggins last week and it was put on by Ethan Donati and it was great. Anyway, I was like, yeah, I've got ambitions to run these type of events. There was 3,000 people there in Melbourne, I think 2,000 Sydney and 1,000 Brisbane, so 6,000 people in Australia. And it was such an amazing event. But yeah, you gotta put down this one, probably a million, 1.5, 2 million at least before you sell a ticket. So it's like, there's a lot of stress, but that was, I think 18 months in the making to make that particular happen. But yeah, I run networking events as well with a business partner of mine and in Melbourne too. It's fun. It's exciting, but not that it's pretty stressful to put on. Anyway, we'll move on, but that's a total, to oh, I'd rather go to events than to actually do that as well. Moving on as well. So we'll talk about the book as well. You talk about play big brand, brand bold. When did it come out and uh, why did you write the book? Yeah. So I launched it in November, 2019. I have to say that I started writing it about two years before where I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book. Like I feel like I, that's something that I wanted to do. Birth in a book, your third child, <laughs> your third child. I know. I was like, let me write a book. Cause obviously that's easy. Not. So I started it and then I was like a bull out of a gate. I feel like Lisa inspired me. She had a lot of books and I was like, oh, I love reading her books and it makes me feel really connected to her. And I like, like we were saying before we started recording, I'm a big storyteller and I'm like, okay, let me do this. And so I was, yeah, like a bull out of a gate. I wrote, I don't know, 22,000 words. And then I just stopped. <laughs> I just was like, I just stopped and I left it for a couple of years. And then I feel like I got to the point in my business where I had massive clarity. I think that when I started the book, I had an idea for what I wanted it to be, but I got to the point where I was like, why am I writing this? What exactly am I saying here? And I think like it probably took me that year or two for me to really find my own voice when it came to business and why I did what I did and how I had evolved over that time as well. And so when I picked the book back up and I had been doing my podcast for quite a while, like at that point too, and I always say, especially to my clients who are wanting to build their personal brand, 
is that the podcast really helped me to develop my voice and it helped me to develop my thinking, my thought leadership, what I wanted to be known for and what I wanted to say. And so I had now accumulated all of this content through the programs that I'd created and through the podcast episodes that I had done. And so when I came back to the book, I felt like I had all of this content now that was just perfect for putting into the book. And so I came back to it with a completely different way of thinking. And so I took a lot of that content, I put it into the book, we rearranged it, copy edited it, put some more stories in and got it to the point where I was like, okay, this is now like I'm happy with it. And we, I did a self, like I did self publishing and we had a big party on the, I think it was the 21st of November because it was the day before my birthday. So we had it on the 21st of November, 2019. I think I had about 60 or 70 people at the book launch. So when they bought their ticket, they got a copy of the book and I signed all the books and, all, and it was so fun and I absolutely loved it. And yeah, it's still, I'm here today talking to you and it's just been such an amazing journey of connecting with people through the book. Absolutely. And having the book launch is like a baby shower. It's a, here's my new baby, here's my new baby. It's great. We're both Scorpios. I'm in November as well, November 14th. So that's cool. Yeah. You can't beat my one. You put it down for two years. I put mine down for 10 years. So I wrote my book in 2010. I started in 2007, finished it in 2010 and I didn't have a voice and I didn't have an audience. So I put it on the shelf for 10 years. I rewrote it six times. And in 2020, I said, it's about time I give birth to this thing because it was such a, a big weight carrying around. But next book, I will do I'll tell more stories because as I said to you before all minds is just fact-based as well moving on in the book you interview 50 women in business and they're very generous with their time and stuff and you ask a couple things about mindset minefields let's go over that so the five mindset minefields that keep coming up number one is talking about caring what people think and asking for permission why do we need to overcome that yeah, so just to touch on that. So basically I'd come from that business and strategy background and from a project management background as well, where I'm like, if this is the goal, then this is how we reverse engineer it. And these are the things that we do. So I was very matter of fact in the way that I thought. And so when I started working with women in business, we would develop these strategies, their brand strategy, their business strategy, and it'd be like, okay, great. And then a couple of months would pass and I'd be like, what's happening? Like, where are you doing what we talked about? And I just discovered that there was all of these mindset minefields, as I call them. And it was something I needed to learn more about. And so I interviewed like these 50 women over a six month, eight month period where I would just ask them a whole lot of questions and what do you want to be doing? And if you're not doing that, what are you doing? And what is it that you want from your business and all these things. And so I really got deep into it. And so one of the biggest things was caring what people think. And I think that we're in a video era now as we're talking on the podcast in sort of 2023. And I still think that it's one of the biggest issues that, that a lot of entrepreneurs have. And the interesting thing is that when you work for somebody else, it's not something that you deal with a lot because it's their brand. So you're behind somebody else's brand. You're doing the work. If people buy it, there's, it's just, it, it doesn't really impact you because it's not your business and it's not your brand. But when we're in our own business, now we care. What if somebody doesn't like what I say? What if somebody doesn't buy from me? What if I get rejected? What if I say something and somebody disagrees with me? And so all of these stories that we tell ourselves about what's going to happen, that is going to have a negative consequence just stops. I like so many people in their tracks from sharing what it is that they have because of that fear. Amazing. I have a quote that I've heard many years ago. It talks about in your twenties, you care what people think about you in your forties, you stop caring what other people think about you. And in your sixties, you realize no one was actually thinking about you in the first place. <laughs> And it's like, oh shit, no one was actually thinking about me. It's, I care what people think. And it's like, I don't care what people think. And it's like, fuck, no one was actually really thinking about you in the first place. Um, no, that, that's cool. The other minefields you talk about is, will it work? 
comparisonitis. We, we just think we compare, compare. Imposter syndrome is big. A lot of people, you know, doing that's that comes from comparing as well. And you think you're not good enough because you keep looking outward and not inward, and then protecting your headspace as well. How important is it to protect your own environment? I know you talk about that in the book as well, but your particular space. How important is that to protect that physical and mental as well? Yeah, I think that so from a physical perspective, I think just put yourself in situations that you know are going to stretch your thinking, create an environment for you to thrive in and make sure that you're around people who support you to be able to achieve the big goals and ideas that you want to. And it's not about having yes people around you. I almost think that we thrive in an environment where people, where there's that banter around. So you've got this idea, how are you going to do it? What does it look like? Let's bounce some things around. And so you want to have that. But also because we live in this online world, I think protecting your headspace is really important too, is that if you're following people who make you feel like rubbish, you need to be self-aware enough to clean that up. So if you're like, and I did a podcast on it recently where I was just talking about, you know, being in a content coma where basically you just consume and it paralyzes you to the point where you're just like, I can't consume because I'm not as good as them, or I can't create, sorry, I can't create because I'm not as good as them, or I can't create because I don't know what I would say. And it's just because we've got this bombardment of content constantly if you're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, wherever, and you've just got to make the decision, what environment physically and mentally do I need to keep myself in for me to work at my best, for me to show up and feel great when I create, for me to allow myself enough headspace and quiet for me to actually hear my own thoughts so that I can bring those to life instead of potentially regurgitating what other people say or just being in that content coma and comparison a lot of the time. So I just think that's so important and it's even more important now than when I wrote it back then. Absolutely. Yeah. People are in this hamster wheel of info porn where they just get so consumed with consumption that they trick themselves and we're the easiest ones to fool ourselves into thinking that's creating. And so they don't realize that they're not creating, they're consuming. TV shows is different than creating a TV show. Listening to a podcast is different than hosting a podcast or being a podcast guest. Reading a book is different than writing a book. And we can go on and about this as well. But you got to get off the train of one thing I heard the other day, which is fascinating. So I was at a networking event. And I was like, I don't need to network. I need to, I've got so much fulfillment I have to do. And someone said the word, oh, I've got so much fulfillment, but he's networking. And I thought to myself, why am I even in this room? I've got so many clients already that I need to fulfill their commitments. I don't need any more clients. So that's the same thing as stop consuming content, get your life in order, make your bed, clean your house. Then, you know, it's that catch 22 of don't go too heavy on one side. There's, you've got to find your own balance physically and mentally in the world around us that we're just constantly bombarded with opportunities and content as well. I digress. One of the chapter five, you talk about mind over matter. And I love this one. Money bootcamp. What was the money bootcamp you went to and how did that change your life in terms of money? Yeah. So this is Denise Duffield Thomas. So she's a female entrepreneur. She's been a money mindset coach for years and I've done a couple of money mindset courses as well. And once again, you don't, it's almost like you don't know any of this before you come into the entrepreneurial space. Like when you're working in corporate is what is all of this stuff that people talk about? And then you come into the entrepreneurial space and you're like, now you have to put yourself out there and now you have to charge and now you have to talk about money and now you have to be okay with raising your prices and dealing with refunds. And it's just a lot of stuff that a lot of people feel very icky about. They're like, oh, I like, because a lot of times we've been brought up that money isn't something that you discuss and all the rest of it. So you've got to break through a lot of that. And then you're carrying like a lot of your parents' beliefs about money. Even that, we don't talk about money, a historical belief that has been part of culture where well, you don't talk about money, you don't talk about religion. Those are the two things. But when you start getting into the entrepreneurial space, this is something that you've got to be talking about. And also it's okay to celebrate your financial wins. Like when you're running a business, money is the lifeblood of your business. Like if you don't have clients and you don't charge, you don't have a business. So I think it's just, it really started to help me become a lot more aware of my own money beliefs and how I felt about charging and how I felt about increasing my charging and all the rest of it. And one of the things that I used to do is that if somebody was to say, Suze, how much are you? 
I remember at the time it felt a bit awkward. And so I used to do this thing with my husband where we'd be brushing our teeth or whatever. And I'd be like, ask me how much I charge. <laughs> and, he would, and he'd be like, Suze, how much do you charge? And I'm like, $2,500. And he's like, okay. And I'd say, I'd be like, I'd say it to my dog. I'm like, Bo, I'm $2,500. <laughs> so I just made it feel normal. I just normalized it for myself. Is that an hour or is that a week? I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it? No, I don't know. It was for like, I don't know, a program or for something, consulting, whatever it was. I can't remember. Now a friend of mine charges two and a half grand an hour. And sometimes my heart sinks a little bit. I'm like, that's cool. Oh God, that's a lot of money. I charge $250 an hour. I'm like, oh wow, that's expensive. Continue. Sorry. Yeah. But I love that because I think that those are the conversations that we want to be having. It's, I am always fascinated by people who are like, yeah, I'm a thousand dollars an hour. And I don't think any, the only thought I have is, wow, I'm impressed that you value your time so much and that you know that you'll bring value to the client, that you're totally comfortable to charge that. And then it makes me think, and I think this is where protecting your headspace and cultivating a headspace or an environment where you have people you really respect and when they charge a lot or when they do certain things, it actually helps you to stretch your belief that it's possible for you rather than feeling like you're not enough. And so that's where I think if you can take a look at the people that you follow. So there's certain people I follow where I'm just like, I want to be around them because they talk about money in such an incredible way that it makes me believe that it's totally possible. Whereas there's other people where I'm just like, oh, that makes me not feel enough. So I think it's just about if you've got those people, clear them out and focus on the ones that make you feel like it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Your network is your net worth and surround yourself with winners and people talking about big tickets. I've got friends at million dollar here, million dollars. It's not a big deal to them. And I'm just like, give me one. Yeah, I'll take one. Give me one. Throw one point to it, me. That <laughs> if you're handing them out, <laughs> hand them out. I'll be involved. But no, definitely people first network. One of the th takeaways I got from that, the three P's, positive, patient, and persistent as well they talk about sustain positive being patient and being persistent but just on that michael just i just want to touch that on that for a sec i think that we live in a very like fast and easy entrepreneurial space where i have clients that come to me and they're like i want to make six figures in the next 90 days and they have zero audience this is the first step into their business and like they don't even know exactly what their products and services are and i am a big one for simple business but also realizing that this is the long run this is a long haul we're not here just to it's not just going to happen in a second so that patience and that persistence I think is something that we need to talk about more, especially with people coming and going, and now I'm just going to go and make a million dollars. I think there's that expectation. That's the next question I was going to talk about. You talk about the courage to play big, but it's also the courage to play long, the long game. I, me and Gary V born the same birthday. He stuffed me up because he talks about macro patience, micro speed. So I'm like, do so many things, but also I'm thinking about, oh, when I'm 80, I'm going to be cool. And I'm like, no, you've got to just get stuff right now as well. So I come from the two polarities of macro patience, micro speed, but you definitely need the courage to play long because we're talking about your life. People are trying to make a quick buck, but at what cost or what expense? So yeah, you're right. The whole entrepreneurial game is very lopsided. You just got to get on that in the middle and find your balance that what can you do for decades? What can you talk about or do for decades? That it's a lifestyle, not a job. Like entrepreneurship is not a job. It's a lifestyle and not everyone's cut out to do it. So just make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and you're helping people. That's my big one through there. But yeah, we haven't even talked about branding yet. Branding bold, brand power, brand power baby. Talk about branding, positioning, visual branding, brand personality, chapter eight, you dive into it as well. My philosophy around brand is that I'm all about brand first. As far as business goes, if you can build a brand that you're really proud of, that's positioned well in the market. And I always talk about positioning, like, are you Kmart or sh I'm not going to walk into Mercedes and expect to pay $20,000 for a car. And so you've just got to take a look and say, where am I positioning my brand? And if I want to charge premium prices, is my product premium? Is the look and feel of what I do premium? Is how I talk and show up and am consistent? Is that premium? And so I think when it comes to brand, if you can create a brand that's magnetic, 
where people are attracted to you, what you do, what you say and how you do it, then you'll need to do less marketing and sales on the back end because you've got people that are just like, how do I work with you? And so if you can start to build a bold brand and bold is not about colorful and loud, bold is about breaking the mold, doing things differently, going against the grain. And you can really start to find your own voice and kind of step out of the norm of your industry in order to stand out, then you will find the clients that are right for you and they'll come to you instead of you having to chase. So that's just my, in a nutshell, that's like my philosophy around branding. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And the other big one is like brand experience. So people don't buy products for the products, they buy things for the experience. My wife just bought a thousand dollar Louis Vuitton belt recently and it's very thin and I still couldn't wrap my head around it. Could have bought the same belt for five bucks, but the smile and energy she had when she wears this belt or when she brought it home, you don't get that from a five dollar belt. So she didn't buy the belt, she bought the experience and the feeling. And it's not her first purchase, don't get me wrong. <laughs> She's got high taste. But that's the difference between a brand that creates an experience. And I've bought Louis Vuitton shoes and I've got one pair of expensive shoes. So I wear them every now and then. I bought them years ago when COVID first happened. Don't ask, long story short. I was on a cruise, the last cruise of Australia, we locked in Sydney, lockdown started to happen. I was in Louis Vuitton. I just bought a pair of shoes. And every time I wear them, I've worn them probably maybe 45 times. I feel great. I feel great. Now I could have bought cheap shoes, but you know what? The feeling that I got from the brand, so the brand carries over that experience. So how important is it to create a brand that has some sort of experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. So there's two things with that. So Marty Neumeyer is the godfather of branding. He wrote the brand gap and the brand flip, if you ever want to dive into brand. And one of the things that he says is that brand is the collective experiences that somebody has when they come in contact with you. And so the, so that's the first thing is that experience is everything. Like when somebody connects with you, when they're talking to you, when they come to your website, they will have an immediate feeling when they're on your socials, they'll have a feeling when they listen to you, they'll have a feeling. And so you've got to really think about what is the feeling I want to create for my audience and for my clients. And you need to craft that. I think people leave it to chance. And I actually want you to go and say, when somebody contacts you, what is the email that they get? Is that how you would want to the first connection to be? When they buy from you, what's the experience? When you send gifts, what's the experience? And the second thing is that with the Louis Vuitton belt and shoes, which I love, is that brand is about identity and you have to understand when your client buys from you, what does it say about them? So somebody can go and buy a $20,000 car or they can go and buy a $120,000 car. The car will still get them from A to B. The, start, the car still has seats, an engine, a steering wheel and all the rest of it. But the car says something about the person who's driving it and people who want luxury goods and luxury products and are willing to pay for them. It's about their identity and what it says about them. And so your brand needs to, you need to understand what your brand says about your audience so that you can speak to them at that level. Stop reading my brain because I worked for Mercedes Benz for a long time and sold Mercedes Benz for a long time. So I can definitely talk about brand and the, their slogan is the best or nothing. And people buy the product based on what they feel and it's crazy. We could talk for hours on this as well. One, one last couple of things before we jump off is storytelling and story selling as well. What's the difference? This is my favorite. We were talking about the fact that the book's got a lot of stories. So when we listen to stories, number one, we lean in more. So when you're going to tell me a story, I'm like, and then what happened? And then what happened? So when we create story as part of our brand, number one, it makes us more memorable. People remember stories more than they remember facts and figures. The second thing is that when you tell me a story, I will come back again because you tell me great stories. And so I know that the next time I come and visit you, I'm like, what else does Michael have to tell me? Yeah. The other thing is that what you can do is that when you become a great storyteller, you can also story sell. And so what I mean by that is let's say I've got a product and I say, and I'm on socials or whatever. And I say, so I was working with my client, Michael, the other day, and we were talking about how you create events. And I know that this is everything that we've learned about events. And these were my experiences when it comes to events. By the way, I've got an event coming up in September that you have to come along to. If you really want to have an experience where you're going to feel amazing, learn a lot and connect with other people, then you have to come to that. But anyway, so Michael and I, when we were talking about events, 
And so you can, it's, I call it the drive by sale. And so when you story sell, it's about sharing an experience with your listeners about something that's happened, something you've learned, but in the process of telling them that you're also giving them an insight into the product, the service, the event, or whatever it is that you're actually talking about. And so when we share things that our clients, that we've had conversations with our clients and the problems that I might've solved when I had this conversation with my client, the listener is actually going, I have that problem. Maybe Suze can help me with that as well. I do this on the podcast. So the reason, another reason I do the podcast is I don't have time to do short videos. Tell me if my real audience listens to the podcast and they don't just watch the first couple of minutes and take off, they know who I am, what I'm doing. Like I'm not, this is me communicating to my audience where I'm at now, what's happening today, what I'm selling, what I'm interested in. This is my opportunity as well to story sell and story tell, but I've got nothing to sell, but also telling them about this is my life as well. Cause you're, it, this is probably a good place to segue your podcast as well. How many episodes you've done? A couple of hundred. That's your journey, your story. Do you want to talk about the, your particular podcast as well? Plug that in. Yeah. Yeah. I love my podcast. So I've got the brand builders lab podcast. I think I'm at 200. I want to say 270 maybe about that. Awesome. I've done nine, I think 978 it said. I've deleted a few. Oh my God. That's amazing. That's so good. But what actually happened is that I was in a renovation. I used to do YouTube videos. This is years ago. And then I was, we were renovating and I couldn't really do that. And I was listening to Darren Rouse. Do you know who Darren Rouse is? He was pro blogger. No, never heard of him. So back in the day when blogging was big, Darren Rouse used to talk about pro blogging and photography and stuff. And he was on a Facebook live and he said, if you want to be a speaker, which I was, and I wanted to do more of, he said, start a podcast. He said, because basically you have to give a keynote every single week and you'll become really good at sharing your message. People will be able to listen to you and get your vibe and see the quality of what you share as well as like your energy and your personality. And I have gotten a lot of speaking gig bookings from the podcast. I've never spoken once. Should I be a, I should, I should, what am I doing? You got to hook me up, hook me up with your people. Yeah, it's been really great. And people who I just have it, I ended up speaking at a financial advisors conference with a hundred financial advisors about brand experience because the director of that business listened to my podcast, which I thought was, I was just like, really? So you just get lots of different people that listen. But for me, as I said earlier, it's really helped me to develop my thought leadership and it's helped me to lean into how I think. So as an extrovert and just my personality, I develop my thinking through speaking. So I'm like somebody who goes and brainstorms and speaks out loud and that sort of thing. So the podcast, sometimes I'll be on a podcast talking about a particular topic. And as I'm talking about it, new thoughts are coming to me and new ways of talking about it. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that I had that in me to say. And it's been great. That's ex exactly what I do. So you just, you're reading my mind. It's, ex it's exactly the same thing. And it's an opportunity for you to talk about what you're passionate about as well. And it's your show. You can do what you want as well. Just to tie it back to finish off the book, you finish off chapter 16 and it's called hiring yourself as a CEO of your business. How important is this to hire yourself as a CEO of your business? Yeah, this is a mindset thing as well. So what happens is that we come out of employment, we go into our own business, and then we just become an employee and a slave to our business. This is where people get burnt out. They work all the time. They're like at the beck and call of clients. They are not pricing themselves well. They're not looking at their numbers, things like that. They're just like on this churn and burn wheel. And what happens is that when you decide to hire yourself as a CEO, you actually take a step back and you take time for your own business, like your business should always be your best client. Yeah, where you take time out. So Mondays are my CEO days, where I'm like, where are we at with money? Do I need to send invoices out? Where are we at with our metrics and analytics? Are we hitting goals? Where are we at with our projects? If I wanna hit these goals in my business this year, when are we doing it? How are we doing it? What do I need to do and how do I need to plan? I have my meeting with my VA every, Monday as well. And so what is she doing? And does she need me to help her with anything? When you step up as the CEO, you can start to make more informed decisions. And I always say you can get to make like more commercial decisions rather than emotional ones. 
and you can start to set the culture for how you want your business to run. So we say yes to these clients, we say no to those clients. We don't do that work, we do this work. Is the way that we're charging right now gonna get us to our goal for this year? If it's not, then we need to start increasing our pricing and looking at how we do that. So you really come at it from a place of running a business well, rather than just being on the churn and burn cycle of doing whatever comes your way and being reactionary. Got it. That's amazing advice. One last thing to plug, if people want to work with you and find you, is it the best way to do apart from the book, the Brand Builders Academy with the online course too, or what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Yeah. So if they just go to suzechadwick.com, then you can find out all about me there. We just rebranded the Brand Builders Academy to the Bold Business Academy just this year, which is awesome. And yeah, but you can find out podcast programs, coaching, all there. Perfect. Sue? Thank you for being a great guest on the Best Book Bits podcast and to my audience out there. Where do you spend time socially as well? Where can people connect with you socially? Yeah, Instagram. So I'm Suze Chadwick on all social platforms, but I like to hang out on Instagram the most. Awesome. Thank you for being a guest on the podcast and yeah, to my audience, follow, you, follow Sue, check out her book. If you're in business, yeah, if you've come this far in the podcast, you know that she knows her stuff. So check her stuff out and we shall speak soon. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks, Sue.